everything you have done so much for us we acknowledge that it is your doing it is your power it is your name that is to be glorified and even tonight I ask that your name will be exalted in our midst and that in the name of Jesus let this atmosphere be congealed with your presence we subdue every influence, every thought pattern, every mindset, every force that is not of Jesus Christ. We capture them and bring them under subjection to the Lordship of Jesus. We thank you for your presence that is in this place. And we know that you will speak to us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. I want you to pray for just two minutes. Is that okay? I want you to ask the Lord to transform your life by the power of His Word. Let there be a shift in your life and in your destiny. By reason of what you are about to hear and encounter tonight, open your mouth and pray in the name of Jesus. Just two, three minutes. We are a people and a house of prayer. Can you raise your voice to the Lord? Father, a transformation a 
by the power of your word an encounter that will change and transform me an encounter that is ready to shift me to another place in destiny it says as we behold him we are changed from glory to glory as we behold the image of the Spirit of the Lord, we are changed from glory to glory, from faith to faith, from grace to grace. Transform me, cause a change in my mindset, cause a shift in my thought pattern by the power of the world. Let something happen for good to my destiny. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Come on, say that amen like lively and believing people. Hallelujah. God bless you. Please take your seat in the presence of the Lord. It's good to see everybody again. I welcome you to Pneumatic. This is the place where we experience nothing but the wisdom, the presence, and the power of Jesus Christ. And I want you to realize tonight that you are in that atmosphere. There's an encounter that God has for everyone here tonight by the power and the revelation of His Word. That will cause a change and a shift in our lives and in our destiny to the end that God be glorified and that the image of Christ find expression in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. First of all, I want to appreciate the Lord again for what He's doing in our midst. For all the testimonies that we have heard in this place today and at other times that may not be shared for want of space. I want us to just give God a big clap of praise for all that he's doing in our midst. Amen. And I want to make us understand something if... You will permit me. I don't want us in this house to come to the point where we trivialize miracles, signs, and wonders. Once we begin to exhibit that attitude, the glory of God, the power of God that causes it to manifest would lift. God is always conscious of a people that honor and celebrate Him and His doings in their midst. There are other congregations that may not always see these kind of things at work. Not because they don't know God or they don't serve God. So these are the workings of the grace of God. Are we together? And I want us to celebrate it every time we hear the testimonies of the things that God is doing in our midst. Uh, Amen and amen. I want you to know that I distance myself from everything that God does. Every time I come to this place, the last thing I tell the Lord in my house is that Jonathan's name will not be seen or heard, but that the name of Jesus be glorified alone. So I'm amazed, but I'm happy with what God is doing. And I want to announce to you, that those of you that are still expectant before the end of this month, your miracle is arriving your doorstep. And again, that we are going to see even greater miracles before the end of this year. Miracles that will dumbfound every one of us. Miracles that can only be by the power, the hand and the grace of God. The time is coming and it will be very soon. Where we'll even see the dead raised in this place. I have faith for anything. Amen. Two Sundays ago I told us 
that the easiest part of the job is the miracles. The reason is because it's not me that does it. What I'm about to do is my part. When it has to do with the workings of the Spirit of God, it's not my business. And because of that, it is as easy and as possible as it can get. I tell you the truth, there's a revival that is breaking forth in this house. We are getting ready to see the dead raised, lepers cleansed, cripples walking in this place. People waking out of comas. Are we here? Strange manifestations of the walkings and the power of God. Very soon, the healing of fibroids and cancer will be normal in this place. Normal. And my desire is not only that God will do it here, but that every one of us will carry that same anointing in your workplaces, in your schools, in your streets, in your neighborhood, that you will become the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's get to the word. We'll continue our series as we started family and relationship series. Family life and relationship series. Part 3. I want to celebrate God for Pastor Moses. He's here with us. Can we put our hands together and honor him? Is this how you celebrate people? Thank you, sir. Amen. It's good to always have you around. Is Madam here? Okay, where is she? Please celebrate God for his wife. Where is she? Okay, bless you, Mama. Good to see you. Amen. It's an honor to have you around, sir. And your coming today was inspired by the Lord. Because... Um, there's something we will have you do here before we are done. By the end of this teaching, we are going to pray. The Lord put it on my heart for us to pray, take our time to intercede for marriages and for families today. We're going to take about 15 to 20 minutes to do that. So I'll try to be as brief as possible in my teaching. And then we'll take our time to really pray. We are going to agree and settle certain things. And, uh, wage a war against the kingdom of darkness one of the greatest point of attack this end time is families the reason is because when a family is broken apart or is destroyed you have a dysfunctional church and as a result a dysfunctional society and uh, we are going to wage war against that and we are going to insist that certain things that the word of god provides that we should enjoy in our families and in our marriages will begin to happen the end of this series is not only for enlightenment but for empowerment so that those of us that are not married will walk not only with the knowledge but with the right empowerment and succeed in our marriages and those of us that are married will find joy, happiness, and bliss. And heaven will be on earth as God has determined. In the name of Jesus. If you agree with me on that, say amen. amen. So pastor, we will have you come up and lead us in that session of prayer. The Lord told me yesterday, I never knew you would come. The Lord just told me that I should give you that moment. And God can never be wrong, so he's here tonight. Thank you, sir. Um, our daddy is here, Mr. James Harman. Can we celebrate God for him? God bless you, sir. You're welcome. He's a staff with the university, and uh, some of us saw his wife here last week. And I'm happy that the entire family is here. Mommy, you're welcome. Please celebrate God for mommy. Amen. Amen. God bless you. The foundations of a successful home. This is the part three of this family life and relationship series. And um, you know, every part will give it a title uh, so that we can understand what we are looking at. The foundations of a successful home. Trust me, what you are going to hear tonight will not just bless you, but it will bring a mental and a spiritual shift in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ. How come it's only this side that says amen? This side, I don't understand. Amen. 
So let's start this way. Let's start by defining marriage, first of all. Um, just a quick preview for those of us who have not been around for the series. I will encourage you to ensure you get the teaching uh, from our resource centers online or you can get it from the media department after the service. We started by defining relationships and then from there we looked at God's model for the man and the woman. God created male and female. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, when he created man, he created two models, male and female. And we looked at God's uh, scriptural blueprint for the male and female and how they are expected by God to function. Amen. And uh, we also looked at kinds of men and women that you should not date and marry. Because of time, you can go back to those messages and uh, get them so that you can be in pace with what we are doing. So today, we want to look at the foundations of a successful home. Now, if you permit me, we didn't finish the last part, uh, which was understanding the laws of relationship. Like I said, we looked at relationships. We tried to define it, the types of relationship, uh, the purpose for the creation of man, the models, male and female. We looked at all of that looked at kinds of men and women you shouldn't marry um, and there was something else we didn't look at that I want to rush briefly if I'm permitted before we cross over to the teaching today so am I permitted I want to just share briefly with us what to do when in a relationship this should be the courtship stage when a man and a woman come together just before they seal their union with the covenant and the vows of marriage, um, there is always a brief period that we refer to as courtship. And I thought it best not to assume that we know everything, but to bring this to our understanding so the Lord will help us. Particularly because many of us are young people here and many of us are yet to be married. Some of us are married, so we thank God for that. But for those who are not married, I think this path will really help you. And for those who are already married, you can also get this to coach your children or friends or people who come around you who will one day, one day uh, be ready to enter into this stage. So what to do when in a relationship? First of all, I want you to note this, that singles should not be in a rush to start a relationship and are only advised to start courting when they are sure of marriage. Just because you see a lady and you like does not mean you should start a relationship. There should not be a rush in there. Uh, when you see somebody you love and um, that your heart accepts, it is important that you take a little time to study them. That's the reason why one of the kinds of relationships we spoke about is friendship. So it's okay to create a, a friendship uh, um, union with that individual uh, so that you can understand them, so that you can build communication with them before crossing over to the point where you start making your proposals brothers is that true but you know some brothers they have so much faith and boldness they just see the lady and they walk up to her the lord said the thus said the lord is that true <laughs> that one doesn't work these days again ladies am i wrong it doesn't work like that again no? amen so it is important that you don't rush take out time to study the person from a distance the reason is because when you come close to a person and there are emotional attachments especially if that person likes you or wants to be with you there are tendencies that pretenses can be put up 
So there are things that you cannot see when you are close that you can only see when you are far. Is that true? So it is important you take your time, especially as the man, uh, pray about it, and even as the woman too, because these days ladies hardly pray. I know that because I have a lot of daughters, and I've been doing a lot of prayers for them. Amen. And after this series, I'm not doing prayers again. You will learn how to fast, and you will learn how to pray in the name of Jesus. And don't bring picture for me. You know that you know that thing. The pastor, you know, you, you can't imagine. They'll bring two pictures for me. So just in case the picture is in your phone now, you are planning after the service to meet me. Please uh, present the picture to God, but bring the offering you came with. In the name of Jesus Christ. Mm, that one should be received with thanksgiving. Amen. So these are the things that I will advise you to do very quickly. Number one, get to know each other properly. When you are in the stage of courtship, get to know each other properly. Get to know and understand that person spiritually. What is the level of their relationship with God? Are they born again? In fact, these days, that's the first question you should ask yourself. Before you get into an emotional entanglement, find out, are you, is this person born again? The Bible says we should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what friendship has light with darkness? What relationship has a believer with an unbeliever? And what has the temple of God with idols? Many people, many young people are dating unbelievers. Many young Christians. And, and especially when they are not properly counseled or they are strong-willed, by the time they get married, you see, when a, when a man or a woman is an unbeliever, they don't have the seed of God in them. So no matter how much you correct, the life of Christ is not in them. No matter how much you instruct or you correct or you talk, they can't change because they are not the same with you. Are we together? Particularly to the ladies, please don't look at how he looks or the car he's driving, like the way I'm dressed now. And you saw me in church. You say, oh, this guy must be. It can be a lie on that we are suited. Are we here? We must go beyond the physical. We must go beyond the carnal. Try to know that person. Discern that person. You are a child of God. God is your father. His spirit is in you. If that person is his son or his daughter, his spirit will speak to you and confirm and witness to you that, yes, that person is my daughter or my son. Know and study that person mentally. How competent are they? Some of us are intellectuals. We love information. We love to grow mentally. Don't end up with somebody that will sabotage that part of your life. So study and know them spiritually, mentally, educationally. Get to know their qualification. Uh, it's important to don't say it's not important because there are some men that have a problem with their wives having more degrees than them yes or no and also try to know them sociologically try to know their sociological status what is their reputation before people who are they in the church in society what kind of friends do they hang out with he should not tell you he's a believer and half of his friends are drunkards. Then among the other half, half of the other half, they don't know whether they are born again or not. Then it's just a few, just, sister, please, stay out of that. Amen? I expected this silence today. So, but no matter how you keep quiet, I will talk, I will say the truth. Say amen. These things are very, very important. So get to know each other properly. Number two, find out about the family and the origin of your partner. Find out about the family and the origin of your partner. Where do they come from? What kind of family was he or she raised in? Do they have their both parents alive? 
or one of them is late or both is late at what time did one or both of the parents die so you can be sure if they had proper upbringing what is the faith and the belief of the parents are they christians or are they traditional worshipers very important in fact i counsel couples who come to me intending to get married also study the spiritual background of that family what is obtainable there are they still under the powers of darkness or the kingdom of god is at reign in that place try to find out things about transgenerational patterns transgenerational curses transgenerational don't just blindly get married and suffer your man of god are we together here very important otherwise if you don't study some of these things the moment in fact you don't even have to get married for the spirits involved in the family to know that you are now in a union with this person and then you begin to suffer from certain things i spoke with a lady not too long ago it was a complaint you know needed prayers and she told me how that she said apostle something is wrong with me i guess from abuja also i said why do you say that a believer she said i feel something is wrong with me any guy i date they start declining and falling in their resources and their finances before they meet me they are doing well but the moment we start a relationship things start to fall about and in fact the last guy i was with he was doing well before he met me when we started the relationship everything started to fall apart in his life as i'm talking to you now he's married and he has risen again this was what she said so it is very important that you study if you don't know those things make sure your parents guide you make sure your pastor let there be somebody around that guides you to really understand especially when it has to do with tribal sentiments are we here because i'm talking to people who are majorly in africa sometimes you your parents may not want from this tribe and then you get into the relationship only to discover and then there's a tussle amen so to avoid all those things find out about the family and the origin of your partner number three be sure of your financial capacity be sure of your financial capacity and i want to tell you not only the men the men and the women financial capacity is not that you are doing it's not only that you are doing something to earn a living but are you able to manage resources are you prudent with finances all right but particularly the husband must be doing something the bible says god gave adam a walk in the garden before eve came and he was doing that work no be so so you don't marry on credit i'm trusting god i'm trusting god let's trust god together but when it has been done we can now get married because the moment you get married it's not just about the two of you children will come in school fees must be paid they must be fed some of us don't even appreciate the sacrifices of our parents you go back home now after this meeting there's food waiting for you you go and eat but by the time you get married and you have to feed certain people that's when your eyes will open are we here so be sure of your financial capacity make sure you are doing something even if the major door you are trusting god for has not opened at least let there be a window is that true good and i'm speaking to boto because sometimes in a marriage situation sometimes i don't know why god determines it like that but sometimes the woman tends to be more blessed financially and if you are like that as a woman don't be proud i know the story of a i mean real story that very close to me of a couple who got married when they were about to get married both of them are graduates but the man was not doing anything substantial i think he was just doing little businesses there and there but the wife was working in a bank a consolidated bank so she was richer 
But they trusted God together, got married, and I think three months after their marriage, the young man was appointed as the chief protocol officer of the governor of a state. And his salary became almost three times his wife. Amen. So in cases like that, neither the man or the woman should become puffed up and say, after all, I'm the one bringing, no, 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 that's, you're not matured if you do that. Amen. So be sure of your financial capacity. Number four. You know, <laughs> if you like, don't say this finance thing is not important. When you go and knock door, is it knock, knocking of door they call it? And they give you list. And the list is in five zeros. That's when you will now you you come back and look for this message. Amen. It doesn't matter whether the parents are God-fearing or they are Christians. You will definitely go there and list will be... Amen. Number four, be sure of where you will stay when you eventually get married. That's another thing to consider too. Be sure of where you stay when you eventually get married because you need a house to build a home. Are we here? And then number five, maintain sexual purity. Very, very important. Maintain sexual purity. That's why I advise that you are not always together. I'm talking to singles now. You are in a court. You are you are courting one another. You're not married. If you are married, (laughs) license has been given. Permanent license. No renewal. But if you are not married, it's a taboo. It's a sin as believers. So I will advise that you are not always together in a private place. Emotions can come up. Somebody say, ah, but apostle, the Bible says that if you're born, you are born, we are born in, we are born in. So if you are born in, look for fire service. Amen. To quench the, the fire. <laughs> so maintain sexual purity. The Bible says marriage is honorable to all the bed undefined. But homongers and adulterers, a, a relationship where they begin to cohabit and have intercourse before marriage hardly will last when they get married. If you don't believe me, experiment. But I advise you not to. It hardly. Because there is no respect, no dignity. Amen. And you know, in this our social media generation is fast fading away. We feel it is not important. As I'm talking now, somebody say, ah, but Apostle, are you not condemning me? No, I'm not condemning you. I'm just speaking the truth. It is very, very important. It's a pride that you want to pass down to your children. And then bring them up in the fear of the Lord. Let them learn to wait as well as you waited. Amen. So those are some of the few things that you should note when in a courtship. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. So let's come to today's teaching. The foundations of a successful home. Let's start by defining marriage. Let's look at the term marriage. Marriage. Number one, I said marriage is an institution ordained and ordered by God. Is an institution ordained and ordered by God. It is not a man's idea, neither was it man's initiative. It was established and ordained by God. Number two, marriage is an institution that portrays is an institution that portrays the relationship between a man an institution that portrays the relationship between a man and a woman the man there put in bracket husband and the woman there put in bracket wife is an institution that portrays the relationship between a man husband and a woman Wife, I have to say that because gay marriage is trying to become popular in our days. And with all due respect, it is not scriptural. Amen? 
is between man and woman, not man and man. A comedian said many years ago, he said, God did not create Adam and Steve. God created Adam and Eve. God did not create Ada and Eve. God created Adam and... So for those who are listening from UK, from the US, you will need this one very well. It's an institution that portrays the relationship between a man, husband, and a woman, wife, that reflects Christ's relationship with the church. That reflects Christ's relationship with the church. That reflects Christ's relationship with the church. Comma. Which was orchestrated by God. Which was orchestrated by God. Orchestrated is O-R-C-H-E-S-T-R-A-T-E-D. For those of us who are writing. Which was orchestrated by God for the purpose of procreation. For the purpose of procreation. Procreation and companionship and companionship I said it's an institution that portrays the relationship between a man husband and a woman wife that reflects Christ's relationship with the church which was orchestrated by God for the purpose of procreation and companionship the Bible says in Genesis 1 verse 27 so God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him male and female he created them and God blessed them and said be fruitful and multiply the sole purpose is so that they can procreate conceive and give birth to more men and women and for companionship Genesis 2 18 said it is not good for a man to be alone God said I will create a helper suitable so that's one of the main purpose for why we enter into this institution called marriage number three marriage is the only institution founded by God before the fall it is important to note that marriage is the only institution founded by God before the fall the fall is when Adam and Eve rebelled against the government of God seen by eating the forbidden fruit that was in Genesis chapter 3 so but marriage was instituted before that that means it is a perfect union it is a perfect institution and God is so mysterious that it is a perfect union between two imperfect people are we communicating yes if you are here say amen Amen. good so it's the only institution founded by God before the fall kinds of marriage now this I, I know some of us may know this but it's good we just start on this note kinds of marriage there are about three kinds that I know and I'll share with us there is the civil marriage civil marriage is the union between the man and the woman that is recognized by the laws of the state or the laws of the land okay so we have courts we have judiciary system and you go to a marriage registry and then the law uh, acknowledges that you and this woman or you and this man have been joined together we we popularly call it court marriage right there is traditional marriage this is the union of a man and a woman that is acknowledged by tradition the family it is mostly between the families of both individuals amen well in some tribes in nigeria and in africa they don't really celebrate it that much but in some others they they make a celebration out of it amen and then number three we have spiritual marriage now this is the marriage where the union between the man and the woman is orchestrated by and acknowledged by the church the church is god's authority and god's institution on the earth so any marriage that is done under the government of the church is what we refer to as spiritual or court marriage is that true 
yes so these are the three kinds so that we can be aware now what are the biblical reasons for marriage we have tried to explain and define marriage but i want you to listen to this what are the biblical reasons for marriage reasons why we get married number one to solve the problem of aloneness aloneness alone the bible says in genesis 2 verse 18 God himself said that it is not good that the man should be alone. He didn't say that it is not good that the man should be lonely. There is a difference between alone and lonely. Everybody look up here. There is a difference between alone and lonely. Alone means you are without a companion. Lonely means you are without purpose. So you don't get into a relationship or get married because you are lonely. Go and look for your purpose. Or go and look for something to do. Are we here? God said it is not good that the man, the man, should be alone. But that man was first of all doing something. He was walking according to the purpose of God. He was fulfilled as a man alone. And because he was fulfilled alone, God decided if one shall chase a thousand, definitely two shall chase so to solve the problem of aloneness because a lot of young people in relationships now because they are lonely that's why even after they break up with the guy or with the, the lady two weeks later they send whatsapp message how are you and they broke up amen so let me just maybe the singles will appreciate it amongst us let me give you an advice if you break out of a relationship maybe because you later realize this person is not uh, does not suit the standards of the word of god or you know does not reflect the model of a male or a female or because of certain disagreements that you know are red flags and even god will permit you to let go of that relationship my advice is when you break off of course you are going to have emotional um, setbacks you will have a you have episodes of being depressed or discouraged my advice at those moments is increase the tenacity of your relationship with god are we here it's as if you are not you are pretending as if you don't you don't relate with what i'm saying so that you don't go back to Egypt after two weeks and you now send the guy a text message. Say, how are you? Have you eaten? And it was a slap that ended the relationship. What you are saying is, I'm, I'm missing those slaps. I need to go back to those slaps. Or as a young man, you, you find out that the lady is unfaithful. She keeps going around with other people. Even while you are still in the relationship, brother, don't go back to Delilah. The reason why something was destroyed was because he went back to the lap of Delilah. So I will advise in those moments so that you don't experience emotional meltdown or depression. Get involved with God. Increase your prayer life, your walk with God. Spend time in the presence of God. The presence of God, the word of God has the only ability to heal your soul. The psalmist says, he restored my soul. Is that good? I'm not saying you'll be a priest, you'll not see another person. But first of all, heal. Don't jump into another relationship with a wound. You will, you, you will inflict injuries on the other person. Is that true? Whether you answer me or not this night, I know I'm preaching the truth. Amen. And the Spirit of God is still bearing witness in my spirit. If you are here, say amen. amen. Number two reason, biblical reasons for marriage, for companionship. For companionship. The woman is the help, helper to the man, and so that the man is not alone. For companionship. Number three, to avoid fornication. 
to avoid fornication. First Corinthians chapter 7 from verse 1 and 2. Paul was writing to the Corinthian church and setting some things in place. And here is what he says. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to do what? Touch a woman. Now of course that touch does not mean don't shake. No, no, no. It means, you know, intimate. Get intimate or intercourse. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own. So it is a good reason when you decide to get married to forestall or avoid the temptation of fornication. So that's another biblical reason for why we get married, to avoid fornication. Number four, for procreation, like I have said, for procreation. To have children, raise them up in the fear of God and uh, fulfill the scripture that says we should be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth you know in some nations now they are trying to, they are trying to control their population so they approve of birth control pills birth control measures and i'm wondering by the time every family in that city refused to give birth again after a, a period of time the population is going to drop is that true? So these are some of the biblical reasons for why marriage is instituted. Next definition of term, the Christian home. Next term we should talk about, the Christian home. Remember the topic is the foundations of a successful home. The Christian Oh, let's go into the lesson proper now. Psalms 127 from verse 1. Verse 1, 2, and then after that we'll go to Proverbs 24, verse 3 to 4. Can we look up on the screen? Those of us here, I apologize uh, because of the screen that is not correctly placed for you. But those of us that are close, I want us to read this one verse reflectively together at the count of three. One, two, three. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Stop there. King James says, except the Lord buildeth the house. That means if God is not the foundation of what you are building and you call it a home or a marriage, the Bible says you are laboring, but it will turn out to be in vain. So it is important that we understand that God is the foundation of every true Christian home. Give us verse 2. Let's continue. I'll read this time around. It is in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. Go on. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. So when we honor the institution of marriage and a man and a woman comes together in holy matrimony, one of the rewards that God releases to that union to endorse that it was founded under God his children all right and the bible says it is a reward from the lord proverbs chapter 24 verse 3 to 4 proverbs 24 verse 3 to 4 let's rush because of time sorry from okay yes verse 3 verse 3 verse 3 to 4 let's read again if it's on the screen just look at the screen i want us to read again at the count of three Reflectively, one, two, three. Through wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. Just keep it on that verse. So, Psalms tells us that it is God who is the builder, the foundation of every true Christian home. And Proverbs gives us the building materials, the model by which God institutes that home. It says it's true wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 3 verse 19, the Bible says, God founded the earth by wisdom. A marriage is an institution that exists on earth. Small wonder why now in chapter 24 verse 3, the Bible says it is true wisdom that a house is built. 
and by understanding it is established next verse he says by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches three major qualities that are important for a christian home to be built up and to survive the test of time and to produce and function according to god's purpose number one wisdom it is by wisdom it is built the bible tells us by understanding understanding number two understanding means comprehension understanding means you come to terms with god's pattern of things the wisdom there is the pattern that god reveals for the creation or the existence of anything understanding is comprehending that pattern and i want you to understand that every home on this earth has god's unique purpose attached to it there is a unique purpose for why you are coming into a union of holy matrimony with that woman or with that man which is different from the purpose of your friend so you can only learn from your friend but you should not compare or try to copy your friend because there is a purpose for that home understanding next verse tells us the third ingredient it says by knowledge knowledge is information acquired before you get into marriage it is important that you have sufficient knowledge that's why marriage is between a man and a woman not a boy and a girl unfortunately we have a lot of boys and girls It's when they got married they now discover that they are boys and girls how do i know three nights after marriage the husband has slapped the wife why because she put too much maggi in the food amen so it is important one of the things that connotes maturity in the life of an individual is how much knowledge they are exposed to per time don't walk through life especially entering into any institution that god has founded at any season of your life without accurate knowledge knowledge is light to a believer it is knowledge that guarantees transformation amen the christian home the christian home is an atmosphere write this down the christian home is an atmosphere the christian home is an atmosphere and not just a building it's an atmosphere where a family lives dwells and thrives it's an atmosphere where a family lives dwells and thrives is an atmosphere where a family does what lives and what dwells and what thrives let's say it together at the count of three one two three lives dwells and thrives you are not saying it like you have written it it once once more one two go lives dwells very important you note those words is an atmosphere you need a house to have a home all right but the house itself it's not the home this means that it is within the responsibility of both the husband and the wife to create and cultivate that atmosphere that we call a christian home it is a place to be enjoyed as much as it's a place to build and cultivate that is the reason why by the end of this series any marriage or any home that is suffering any form of shipwreck god will heal it completely in the name of jesus the home should be enjoyed not tolerated it should be enjoyed not endured it should be celebrated not tolerated and it's also a place to build and cultivate so like i said we have the responsibility it will be foolishness to say it is up to god to make this marriage better no god is the foundation but the two of you must work together having said this let's go to the belly of the teaching tonight and been to round up i have come over in my studies 
that a lot can be said about marriage. As a matter of fact, you can take an, a lifetime studying about marriage. Ask our parents who have been married together for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. They will tell you truthfully that sometimes they feel they don't know their partner. They are still trying to know their partner. So it's a lifetime institution. That's why my father, my biological father, will always say anytime he's joining a wedding, he will say marriage is the only institution where they give you a certificate before you start. Other institutions you graduate before they give you the certificate. They may even hold your certificate for 10 years. But marriage, you collect it first. You understand? That means no graduation. So there is a lot involved. But as I took out time to pray and to study on this, looking for what to deliver to us, I realized that we can at least deal with the foundations. If we understand the foundations and set it at right, then the institution on top will be solidly built. Having said that, I realize that there are four major pillars that will serve as the foundation for every successful home. There are four major pillars, and I want to share these four pillars with you quickly and then we will close. Four pillars. that serve as the foundation of a successful home. Jesus gave a parable about a house that was built on a rock and another house that was built on sand. And the reason why one of them fell when the storm came and the other one was standing was because of the foundation. Funny enough, not even because of the materials with which the house was built, not because of the architectural design. It was the foundation. So I believe that if we have a grip on the foundation, it will help us to have successful homes and marriages in the name of Jesus. Pillar number one, the spiritual. The spiritual. The spiritual. Let me just mention all of them to us, then we'll, we'll take them one after the other. Number one, the spiritual. Number two, the financial. Number three, the social or sociological. And then number four, the sexual. These are pillars for every successful home. I guarantee you that no family or home that wants to thrive successfully can ignore any one of these. Number one, the spiritual. Number two, the financial. Number three, the sociological or social. And number four, the sexual. So let's start with number one, the spiritual. The spiritual is the couple's, uh, uh, the relationship between the couple and God. How the couples relate with God. How the couples relate to God. It is very important we start on this note because God is the sole author and institutional of marriage. So how the couples relate with God. Are we together? First of all, we should note this, that Christ must be acknowledged as the foundation and head of the home. I've said that over and over again, but it's also good that we note that. When it has to do with the spiritual aspect, how the couple relates with God, it is fundamental that they both recognize Christ as the foundation and the head of the home. Luke chapter 6 verse 47 and 48 very quickly and Colossians 1 verse 18 very quickly please Luke 6 47 48 whoever comes to me and hears my saying and does them I will show you whom he is like he is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock first Corinthians chapter 10 tells us that rock is Christ so it is important that Christ is the foundation Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 and he 
Speaking of Christ now is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, read together with me at this point, he may have the preeminence. This is God's purpose that everything created must have, must have Christ as the foundation and as the first. And it is important that both the husband and the wife recognize that. Not that the husband has another God and is the woman that is a Christian or vice versa. The spiritual allows the couple still nothing. The, script, the spiritual allows the couples to understand headship and authority. The spiritual allows the couple to understand headship and authority. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3, the Bible gives us the format. It says the man is the head of the woman as Christ is the head of the man and God is the head of Christ. So it is the spiritual pillar that helps the couple to understand this organogram of authority and headship. God, Christ, the man, and the woman. Now for that GBV supervisor that is listening to me now, that wants to arrest me and say, Apostle, you are being gender biased. Let's read verse 8. Okay, verse 3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is who? Shout it. The head of woman is who? That doesn't mean that you will now be a tyrant as a man. Oh. After now you go and say, yes, apostle say the head of me. No, 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 no. True leaders don't need to sing or make people know that they are the ones in charge. Leadership is influence. It's not position. Verse 8. For man is not from woman. Please look at your screen because some people can assume here. We are living, you know, this sexism generation, gender based. And as some of you here, ladies who are studying law, because you want to get us some men, you feel that women are the victims in marriage. Wait first. Let's clear the foundation. For man is not from woman, but woman from where? Man. Next verse, we are reading down to verse 10. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, not hair. So this scripture was not talking about a tie. Amen? But I don't have a problem if they tie her tie in your church. Please tie her tie. Be subject to authority. Don't go to your church next Sunday and say, I have new revelation and you don't tie, you are, you, are, you are rebellious. If your father and mother say you must tie her tie, tie her tie. When you get married and your husband permits, fine. Or as a man, when you get married and you want them not to tie her tie in your house, fine. But the first thing this scripture institutes is authority and headship. And the Bible says it is important that the woman understands this. Why? Because of the angels. In other words, the realm of the spirit will fight any woman that rebels against this authority structure that God has placed. That's the reason why Satan came to the woman in the garden first. Quiet church. So the spiritual helps the couple to understand headship and authority. Another thing to note is that the couples become closer to each other as they are closer to God. The couples are closer to themselves in proportionality to how close they are to God. So your husband can only love you as he loves Christ more. And your wife can only submit to you if she's truly submitted to Christ. Is that true? So it is important that as they build their relationship with God, they realize that they naturally will go. Because picture this, God is at the center. The man is here, the woman is here. As the two of them go closer to God, they become closer to themselves. But the far from God they stay is the far they stay from 
each other. That is the reason why the spiritual is the first and foremost pillar of foundation. How to succeed spiritually? That is on this pillar now. What are things you should know to have a successful spiritual foundation? Number one, both husband and wife must have a living relationship with the Lord. Both husband and wife must have a living relationship with the Lord individually and corporately. Individually and what? And what? Please talk to me. And what? So have a relationship with God on your own. And then build a relationship with your wife or your husband. The Bible says two cannot work together except they agree. It says whatever two of you shall agree are touching. Do you know that the prayer of a couple is as powerful sometimes as the prayer of a man of God? Look up here. Look at me. Let me share a story with you. I have shared it before. When I was born... Many years ago when I was still young, I think around five or six years, somebody by witchcraft poisoned me and I became deaf and dumb and insane. This man that is talking to you now. I think I, I saw the picture recently. I'll bring it one of these days and I'll project it for us. Amen. And because it was so bad, they had to remove me from school. Useless. Early in the morning, I just go straight to the dustbin, and that's where I am till evening. Many times I was told that my mother would cry. Is this how this boy will end? But long story short, my father came back from work one day. My father was a military personnel then, and I was told that he came back from work. This was after maybe a year. My mates have proceeded to the next class. And he told his wife, my mom, he said, we can't be casting out demons from other people and bringing healing to people and our son is like this. And the story had it that they held their hands, shut the bedroom door and prayed all through the night. In the morning, I opened that door and went to greet them. And that was how I was healed. <laughs> Never underestimate the prayer of a couple. And if you are married here and you have not built it, start building it. And if you are in a relationship, as far as I'm concerned, you don't love yourself if you are not prayerfully together. You don't love yourself. That's my own. There must be a prayer bond. I have discovered that prayer bonds people more. Just start praying with a person. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that they were all in one accord. Why? In Acts chapter 1 verse 19 I believe. It said they continued together steadfastly in prayers. Not in bonds like prayer. So if you and that lady you are not praying together. You have, you have, you have, for the last three years you people are just. You, you don't pray you just come together. That's the reason why you quarrel every week. Your quarreling is one day on, one day off. Turn those quarrels to prayers. Quarreling will cease. A man that prays always will have his tongue bridled. Because he's always in the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's always in the presence of God. So self-control will be exhibited by the Holy Spirit. He will not always say things that are offensive. Vice versa. So both of them must have a living relationship. Not that the person was a believer two years ago, but now that you want to marry, he has backslidden and you don't know. In fact, how you know that the person is not a believer is when the person begins to ask for sex before marriage. I don't care if they sing in the choir or if they are deacons. Wrong. Are you hearing me? There are some deacons in church that should be born again. That's... <laughs> Let me stop there. When you begin to find them trying to uh, 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 entertain negative compromise, that person is not born again. Run away. Wait. Job say, all the days of my appointed time will I wait till my... You remember the spirituality drama they did. Don't marry a packaged... Wahala. 
Number two, the word of God must be the standard for the home. The word of God must be the standard for the home. Both husband and wife must subject themselves to the authority of the word. It must have a final say. They must be obedient to the word. They must use the word of God to build their principles. Not that little thing gets you offended as a man and you keep mileage with your wife. You don't know the word of God. Because the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down in your anger. But then you are entertaining anger for three days. If you are here and you are like that, deliverance has come to you in Jesus' name. Number three, encourage family devotion. They must encourage family devotion. This is one of the ways by which they can succeed spiritually. Family devotion is important. Good morning, Jesus. Good morning, Lord. Abby? Now, some of you just see the way you are, you are clapping. You have a form in your... In your <laughs> some of you, most times, you clap sleeping. You have already you have accustomed yourself to the rhythm. So, you can be sleeping and be clapping. You can be in two realms at the same time. So, these people just finish. And I thank God for our parents. Whether you like it or not, you must clap there. Finish there. My own family, I don't think you do devotion more than my family. Bishop, you have been in my house before. It's not devotion, it's Bible studies, sir. It's Bible studies. Devotion that they used to pray in tongues. I'm serious, though. Because everybody in my house, by the grace of God, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. So what will come will take like 15-20 minutes to pray. Then when we finish, our father would share. Now, the last time I went there, even me as apostle, like this, I had to go there for family, the morning prayers. They started reading the chapter. I thought it was just one chapter. They finished one, they moved to the next one. <laughs> Till they got to chapter 5, I said, ah! I said, this one is a service now. Now, it's not a must you do that because sometimes people go to work and all. But there should be that place where a family comes together and pray. It is important to build that spiritual foundation of prayer and worship. That's the reason why people come to church and during worship sessions, they are, they are, they are, what's the word that we use now? They are nonchalant or they are, what's the word? Please help me, English people. Huh? Absent minded It's because from the home There is no regard for that But it must, it must be Acknowledged Number four How to succeed spiritually The children should be submissive and obedient to God And to their parents Children should be submissive They should be brought under subjection and obedient to God and their parents. Ephesians 6 from verse 1 to 4. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise. He didn't say, Honor your Christian father. He said, Honor your what? He didn't say, Honor your Christian mother. Honor your what? Even if the man is a drunkard, honor him. Even if the man is a thief, honor him. The Bible didn't say they should. It says honor. Very important. Very important. Look at verse 3. Please quickly because of time. That it may be well with you. And you may live long on where? Fundamental. So the children must be submissive and subjected to God and to their parents. Verse 4. The parents also have a responsibility here. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger. Isn't it? But bring them up in the training and admonition. Don't expect them to just know things. There are many parents who have crossed the boundary of discipline. They are already destroying their children. You don't beat a child until you have taught that child what is right and what is wrong. Amen? Discipline must be according to scripture. 
So even the parents have a role to play. He says, do not provoke them to anger. Do you know that as a father, sometimes you need to tell your children sorry when you are wrong? No, I know we are in Africa. We have ego. We have pride. Six days in a week, she is wrong or he is wrong. But in this one thing, you were at fault. Say sorry. Amen. By saying that sorry, you teach them humility. You are teaching them the fear of the Lord. And they will replicate that. He said, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, what will happen? He will not depart. So parents must set the right example for their children. Number five, I'm rushing because of time. How to succeed spiritually. Couples must exhibit love for one another. Couples must exhibit love for one another. Colossians chapter 3 verse 13 and 14 verse 14 says, But put on love, charity, which is the bond of perfection. The summit of all. They must exhibit love for one another. This is the spiritual aspect for a successful home. Number two, the financial aspect. Where the couples relate with finances and resources. The financial. This is where the couples relate with resources and finances. There is a relationship. I told you when we started this series that everything is built on relationship. There is a relationship between the husband and wife and the resources that they have. These are some few things that they should note. Number one, money important in the running of a home. Money is important in the running of a home. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 12. It says wisdom is a defense, I believe. Wisdom is a defense as money is a what? Defense. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 19. Very good scripture. Write it down on a piece of paper and put it somewhere in your house. A feast is made for laughter and wine makes merry. But money... Does what? Does what? The Bible didn't say... Okay, I'm coming to that. Money answers what? For God to allow this scripture in the Bible, you need to think about it very well. Let's not get religious sometimes. If the Bible says money answers everything, truly money answers everything. Sometimes you even need money to hear from God. Yes or no? You don't believe me, ba? Okay. Somebody came to my house. Somebody came to my house for prayers. Apostle, pray for me and prophesy. As though I'm a prophecy machine. I'm not a prophet. Abi? Uh Uh-huh. Person came for prayers and I noticed that the person didn't bring anything as an offering before the Lord. And he came to receive free prayers. And I just came down from a mountain with the Lord. Ah. I, you may call me any name, but the Bible says don't give your precious pearls to swine. So you know what I did? I laid my hands and spoke English and released the person to go in the name of Jesus. It's not serious. When it's serious to hear from God or she's serious, they will come. Don't look at me and say I'm a carnal person. It's true now. How did Abraham meet Melchizedek? Empty? Okay, we've not been talking about it. (laughs) That doesn't mean you must be materialistic as a man of God, but I tell you the truth. Gifts and money can communicate a level of honor that tears the anointing. Like it or not. There are certain people, even when I don't want to pray for them, God will put their thoughts in their mind. Paul wrote to the Philippian church and again and again, he acknowledged their partnership. In fact, in chapter 1, he said, you are partakers of me. Partakers is not by faith. Partakers is they were giving substance to Paul. So, money is important. The Bible says money does what? Answers everything. There's nothing in the house that you don't need money for. If you say love is natural, it's good. But to build and strengthen that love, you need... 
For God so loved the world that he Okay Some, some people are looking at me With their religious face No problem God bless you Another thing I want you to note number two Is that money is not evil Money is not evil And should not be treated as such Money is not evil The Bible didn't say the love of, uh, that money Is the root of evil It said the love of money That means you are the one that makes the money evil or good It is your attachment to it It can be a good servant and a bad master Amen God said in Haggai chapter 2 verse 8 The silver and gold is mine So note these two things about money and resources How to succeed financially I'm rushing because of time Number one Couples should discuss about money and their financial needs Not just even the couples alone The family Should discuss about money and their financial needs Many families avoid financial discussions. It's not, it's not completely right. They should have sessions and times where they discuss about it. Number two, both the man and woman should understand their needs and their financial responsibilities. Both the man and the woman should understand their needs and their financial responsibilities. They should understand their needs, not wants. And they can't know that except they discuss together. They should understand their needs and their responsibilities. It starts by knowing that they must be financially responsible before they get married. And then in the marriage, practically, as God created it, the man is meant to provide. And the woman is meant to manage. Even though both can however bring something to the home. Are we together? Did you hear what I said? Both can bring something to the home. But according to the way God ordained it, the man has the primary purpose of providing. And the woman has the primary purpose of managing. Managing. Being prudent with resources. That's why we said don't marry a waster as a woman. You are in trouble. Nobody will be in trouble here in Jesus' name. Number three, both should have a concrete financial plan for the family. Have a concrete financial plan for the family. Have a concrete financial plan for a family. I want you to hear this. The foundation of a family is Christ. But the future of that family is plan. Let me say it again. The foundation of every family is Christ. But the future of the family is plan. Somebody say plan. Not plan international. Say plan. Not wishes so plan. Hear this again. Prayer without planning is becoming a burden to God. Prayer with planning is becoming a co-laborer with God. Let me repeat it again. Prayer without planning makes one a burden to God. But prayer with planning makes you a co-laborer. I told you that thanksgiving is the platform for multiplication. Wisdom is the platform for increase. Anytime God sees the wisdom of management and planning, God will put a blessing there even if they are unbelievers. That's why unbelievers are the richest people in the world. Yes or no? Talk to me now. Yes or no? So it's not up to God. Plan is the future of that family. They must sit down, put paper to pen. What are the things they should note? In financial planning for the family Number one They should separate needs from want Separate needs from want Separate needs from want A Gucci bag Is not as important as a bag of rice In the home part time Yes or no I'm not saying the Gucci bag is not good I'm just saying which one is more important 
Is it the bag you will boil and eat? So next time you and your husband or you and your fiancé or fiance walk through a shopping mall, make sure you have acquired the needs first before you face the wants. That some people, you know, in this our, our, our contemporary society, a lot of young people are under too much pressure. And because of those pressure, many of them have entered into debt. There, there is this thing going on now online. They call it loan apps, where you borrow. I'm to, I know I'm talking to some people, and the person is saying, Apostle, please don't talk this one. But I have to say it because as I say it, you are delivered as I'm talking. Say amen. amen. They, that's why they are called loan sharks. You know what a shark is? It looks beautiful outside the water. Enter the water first. All kinds of things. They'll borrow, consume, and they can't pay back until the money keeps accruing. Then they start sending you threat messages. And then you are depressed, you are discouraged. And you come to church and say, Pastor, evil spirits are pursuing me. Or you say, I'll kill myself. You go and buy a <laughs> sniper. <laughs> Amen. So learn to separate needs from want. And let me say it again, please avoid debt at all costs. Avoid debt. As a person, I can't remember when last I was indebted. Maybe three years ago, four years ago, to the glory of God. This is not just because it's God. No. I'm content with what I have. And there's no need to borrow when you are content. Whatever you cannot get, somebody told me this wisdom. He said, whatever you cannot get twice, you are not ready for, or you don't have the capacity for it. So in other words, if you see a bag of 25,000 and you cannot buy it too confidently and your finances is not shaking, it means that you are not in that level. Go for the cheap one of 5,000. Clean it very well. Nobody will know. Yes or no? How about the brothers? Now somebody look at the way I dress and say, Ah! Apostle Nawao. Then he wants to dress like that and he goes to the market. And he discovers that the amount of this suit is more than his salary. If you buy that suit, brother, you are not wise. It will amaze you that this year is the first year I bought a suit for myself. amaze you but I've bought for people I've given I've done a lot and I'm going to show you is I'm, so, I'm going to show you why from scripture that means if you cannot buy a car two times don't buy it because the other the, the second time there implies that you have enough money to maintain the car not just to buy it not that you buy a car and after one month it's sleeping in, in your house in your garage for one week why no fuel no no i'm not saying it's not important but make sure you are ready so separate needs from wants another thing that they should note in having a concrete financial plan is that they must Reserve a percentage of income for savings. Train yourself to reserve a percentage of your income for savings. If you spend more than you earn, you are definitely going to be in trouble. I told us something when we were doing the series on Kingdom Prosperity last year. I said, earn as you spend. Are we blessed? If you are learning something, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Reserve a percentage of income for savings. Number three, create investment ventures. Create investment. Two of you are civil servants. Two of you are working with NGOs. Thank God. But NGO job is not forever. It's not permanent. And some are not pensionable. What can you do to create a future for yourself? Make investments. If you don't know what to invest in, keep saving and build knowledge. Attend business classes, financial classes, pay money. Let them talk to you and advise you. And then pray. God will teach you what to do. Now, let me strike a balance. Prayer alone 
It's not enough to show you what to do to create an investment. No. Sometimes you have to read. Sometimes God will have to make you study the life of somebody and then you borrow an idea from them and it works. Let's not accredit everything to prayer. That's, it's just permitting some level of laziness from us. Let's be responsible. Attend financial classes as a couple. Pay money. Let them lecture you. Have financial mentors. It is important. Every month I have classes on phone. With highly accredited millionaires. People who are well established in the financial world. I have hours I spend online and on phone. It's not just the anointing alone. No. If it was the anointing alone, this ministry would have been running on too much depth. Build your mind. Some of us don't read financial books. It's only the anointing. Power, power, power. You will be powerful, but you will be broke. And your power will never reach anybody. You can hear me now and you are minister to. You have no idea how much was put in place for this service to hold. And all year round. Clap for Jesus. You know why I'm, 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 you know I'm, I'm putting pressure. I can stop here if I want to. But many families are in crisis because of finances. And the problem is not God. The problem is lack of plan. But God will not allow it to be so for us in Jesus name. Plan. Number what now? Number four. Put God first. Put God first in your finances by being faithful with your tithes, your offerings, your first fruits. Make sure God has his place first before any other thing. Once you collect your pay, separate the tithe first. When you have separated the tithe before you can start spending. Don't spend, then later you now remove your tithe. That's not tight. It's one tenth, but it's not tight. It's the first, because the first of everything belongs to God. And then number five, avoid wastage and conversiousness. Avoid wastage and conversiousness. Avoid wastage and covetousness. Avoid wastage and covetousness. Hallelujah. The social, the social aspect. Let's try to wrap up in the next 10 minutes. Just be patient with me. We'll be done by 6.30. The social aspect. This is where couples relate with people. The couple's relationship with people. I told us that relationship is the currency for destiny. Everything in this world thrives and functions on relationships. So it is important that they understand the principles, the laws that are involved. How to succeed, number one. The couple must understand their individual self. Let them first of all understand their self. Know your temperament, know your character, know the kind of person you are naturally. Whilst you are trusting God to help you make up for some of those weaknesses. If you don't understand yourself, you cannot understand another person. So the couples must understand their individual self. Number two, the couple must define their relationships. The couple must define their relationships. I'm talking about third party relationships. Who is a family member? Who is a friend? Who is a relative? Who is an acquaintance? Even your ex, your husband or your wife must know. Say amen. I know I just struck something now. Ex. Who called you, honey? Mm, he's just somebody. And then after too much pressure, hey, it's my ex. What are you still doing with your ex on phone? Say, um, you know, the lady, she was not born again. So even though I'm not married to her, at least let me let me try to ensure, brother, look for somebody to do that. Did you hear what I said? When she is born again and she is well discipled, you can relate. Must define their relationships with the third party. Both of you must know each other's relationships and put boundaries. 
That's the reason why I personally, I took it as an etiquette, as a minister. I don't call married couples at a particular time of the day. Once it's 9 p.m., I don't call a married couple. Because in my, in, in my understanding, they should both be together on bed. That's a private moment for them. Even if I'm their pastor and I'm their father, I should respect that. Are we here? Especially those of you who are called into ministry. Be careful so that your spiritual daughters will not become your spiritual concubines. Quiet church. The way I'm looking at you, some of you who brought seed for me, say, Kai, apostle, I'll not give you. So the couple must define their relationships. Number three. Sorry. Okay. They must set healthy and reasonable boundaries. Healthy and reasonable boundaries. In their relationships. Boundaries of communications. Boundaries of meetings. Boundaries of associations. Boundaries of involvement. There are some wives that are closer to their bestie than their husband. That word bestie for me I think is a scam. Please, I'm sorry in case you don't believe, but I think it's a scam. Bestie. My best friend should be my wife. Pastor. Abby? Yes. That's why he came with his wife here. Yeah. Yes. Bestie. If you are a lady here and I'm your bestie, once you get married, I'm not your bestie again. No. <laughs> Amen. I don't know you. Amen. So they must set healthy and reasonable boundaries. Number four, they must create a hospitable and friendly atmosphere. They must learn to create a hospitable and friendly atmosphere. The Bible says in Proverbs 18 verse 24, that a man who wants friends must himself be friendly. Learn to create a hospitable atmosphere. Relationships are important. You must do everything possible to keep and to nurse the relationships God has bring. Learn to be jovial. Learn to be hospitable. First to one another and then to your people outside. There are some men that cannot bring home their friends. Why? Because their wife is hysterical. She's harsh. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, it is better to dwell in the corner of a house top than in the same house with a contentious woman. Amen. It was because Sarah was hospitable that God sat down in their house, ate, and then gave a prophecy about the timing of the arrival of Isaac. Hospitality is wonderful. Personally, when I go to any family or home, I look for that atmosphere of hospitality if i don't find it even if sir even if god is saying something to me i know how to buck, put my hand in my pocket and walk out there are some places i go to i, do, I forget i'm a man of god i follow them and say yes we'll trust god you know why no hospitality no openness there are some places i go to even if i'm not going to prophesy i must prophesy because of the openness so learn to build that within one another you must not always offer food or rice. You may not always have rice. But at least serve water. Do something that creates an environment for the relationships. God, do you know that one person in both your life can change your story? It's not only God that can change people's life. Man too can change man. Oh. You don't know. One person can love you and make a recommendation that gives you a, a contract of 10 million. Are you the same again? Am I saying it, doing it for, do it for the money? No, don't do it for the money. The Bible says in Hebrews 13 that we should be apt in, in, hospitalizing, in hospitality and entertaining strangers. He said because some people have entertained angels in the cause. And God will help us in Jesus' name. And then finally the sexual aspect. Thank God I'm able to finish it today. The sexual aspect. We have looked at the spiritual the financial, the sociological or social, and finally the what? Sexual. 
Proverbs chapter 5 verse 15 to 19. Let's read at least one more scripture before we close. Proverbs 5 15 to 19. Drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Go on. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. He's talking about the importance of sexual intimacy between a couple. Next verse. As a loving dear and a graceful doe, let her breasts satisfy you at all times. At how many times? And always be enraptured with her love. As much as we try to ignore it, the sexual aspect of marriage is a fundamentally important aspect. Perhaps maybe the most is a fundamentally important aspect and God is saying here that both couple, the, the man and the woman must understand this place in their lives and must learn to ensure that they satisfy one another in this aspect this is where couples relate with themselves the sexual aspect I want you to note this God created sex to serve as the consummation of a marital relationship God created sex to serve as a consummation of a marital relationship between husband and wife so if you are not married it doesn't consign you but once you are married God himself so sex is not evil there are some people who teach that sex is the forbidden fruit that man ate it's not true it's not true sex was created by God for the consummation of marriage as far as God is concerned, the oneness between that man and woman is exemplified when they have intercourse. So it is a part that must be understood, accepted, and carefully studied. If you are with me, say amen. Another thing to note is that heterosexuality and not homosexuality is approved by the word of God. Heterosexuality. What do I mean? Hetero means different. Homo means the same. What God approves in a marital situation is not homo, sexuality. What we now have these days in Hollywood, man and man, woman and woman is wrong. It's supposed to be between the man and the woman. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 and then chapter 4 verse 1. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become what? One that joining is not just in spirit and by faith is also in that carnal thing say amen this carnal boy is good for them very important genesis 4 verse 1 he say, and adam knew eve his wife the knowledge there is sexual intercourse carnal knowledge and she conceived you know can i crack a joke for you I was told that how many of you know the thief people the thief language in nigeria and benway state you know they have a traditional church there they call it nkst so i was told that a couple were to get married and then the man and the woman went for counseling so they went to the elders of the church they now asked the man they called his name i said do you know this woman he said yes i know the woman they say hey he knows the woman oh. so the man was confused later on he now realized that what they meant was this no here carnal knowledge you know sexual intercourse then he said no 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 no, no. i don't know how i don't know her. then the elders looked at each other again and say hey he doesn't know her and he wants to marry her <laughs> amen <laughs> So you must define all the no's. Sexual intercourse is beautiful. That's another thing to note. It is beautiful and can be very pleasurable. Can be very pleasurable and is to be enjoyed by both. It is beautiful. It is very pleasurable and is to be enjoyed by both the man and the woman. 
But another thing we must note, however, is that it is an art that must be learned and developed. Now, I know I, I see that, you know, particularly in churches these days, when a couple is about to get married, very little in some churches or some cycles, very little is spoken about about the sexual life. And so they get married and they become strangers to another. And I tell you the truth, sex is so powerful. It can increase the bonding in a home and it can destroy it. So that is why it is something that they should learn about. Now, when I'm counseling couples, it's when you are one week to your marriage that I'll start talking to you about that aspect. Because I'm afraid if I talk three months to you, you may go and do practical and come back with your book before. <laughs> Amen. So let's rush. How do you succeed? Sexual aspect of a home. Number one, the couples should know and understand their body. Couples should know and understand their body. You should understand the anatomy and the physiology of their body. Understand how a man's body functions and how a woman's body works. Very important. Number two, they must both discuss freely about sex. Before you got married, it was, it was sacred. Now that you are married, it is now common to the two of you. They should discuss. Can I tell you something about discussion or communication? Anything you discuss with somebody about, you build more knowledge on that thing and you bond well on that aspect. Are we together? So they should discuss about it very well. Number three, both should find out more ways to enhance their sex life. Both should find out more ways to enhance their sex life. Study together. Look for other ways. It's, you know, it's, it's like exploring a new world. So both of them must find out what are the other ways. What are the different styles. What and what can I do. What are the things I can do before the act so that that satisfaction and pleasure can be achieved? And then number four, there are so much to say here, but let me just stop at number four. Both should avoid using sexual satisfaction against each other as a revenge. You know what I mean? You and your wife, you are quarreling, and then the wife say, not no show for you this night. It's wrong. It's wrong. The Bible tells us that the body of the man belongs to the woman. In marriage, oh, in marriage, the body of the man belongs to the woman and the body of the woman belongs to the man. And one thing about the covenant is that whether you are happy or not, it must be fulfilled. So both should not use that against each other in a place of crisis rather it will interest you to know that sex can often be used to settle quarrels and tension in a marriage amen well let's stop here today put your hands together for jesus Amen. It was quite a long lesson, but we thank God we were able to close today. Next week, we are going to do the part two. There are other things we still need to talk about for the foundations of a successful home. But if you don't remember anything today, at least you can remember the four pillars. Number one is what? The spiritual. Number two. Number three. Number four. Very important. Number four does not consign singles. Though. The Bible says the single man or woman, should, what do, should they do? Focus on their relationship with God. And wear iron pampas. Do you know iron pampas? You know iron pampas? Because if you wear the normal pampas, there are tendencies you can. So wear the one that you use padlock. Until you are married. But if you are married or about to, this is a very important aspect. These four creates the foundation for a successful home. Are we ready to pray? It is important that we take our time to pray after every of these teachings. Now I will uh, 
like to welcome Pastor Moses to come and lead the prayers today, especially. I want us to pray. Amen. I want us to pray. We are going to pray, you know, through what we have learned today and all the other days. And I want us to pray, those of us that are not married, pray into our future that God will ensure by the things we are hearing we'll have a successful home. And then we need to war against the attacks of the enemy in marriages and families. Please be on your feet and receive with me the ministry of Pastor Moses. God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. We are going to pray very briefly. The prayer cannot end here. The prayer cannot end here. These are matters of life and destiny. And uh, James 3, 14, 15 says, There is a wisdom that is earthly. There is a wisdom that is sensual. There is a wisdom that is devilish. This generation is bedeviled with all kinds of things that social media is spewing at us. And is birthing that sensual, earthly and demonic wisdom that is perverting our mindset. But we celebrate God for the wisdom from above. Verse 17 of that James chapter 3. Can we celebrate God for this word we just received? It says, the wisdom, the wisdom from above is pure. This wisdom is from above. I want you to be very sincere to yourself. If there's any issue that requires utmost, ruthless, brutal sincerity, it is this issue of marriage. You need to be very, very sincere with ourselves. And as the word of God has come as a two-edged sword to cut us right and the left, it's time to self-reflect in a very sober way and communicate your sincerity to God in prayers that God will give us grace to apply this wisdom. Wise people are known by what they do. Intelligent people are known by what they say or what they think. But what you do, wisdom is justified of our children. We have received this wisdom from above. I want you to make a sincere prayer. Say, Lord, I receive the grace to apply this word, this wisdom from above. Not the cultural, not the earthly, not the sensual, not the devilish, not the demonic, not the perverted wisdom of this age. I receive the grace. I receive the grace. Jesus, I receive the grace to apply the wisdom of your word. To apply the wisdom of your word. To apply the wisdom of your word. In every area of my mind. the relationships I maintain. Let it communicate the wisdom that is from above. The wisdom that is pure. The wisdom that is meek. The wisdom that is undivided and undiluted. The wisdom of the word of God. Jesus has been made unto us wisdom and God has communicated the word of God to us. The clarity and the power. Say, Father, I receive grace. Father, I receive power. Father, I receive grace. Father, I receive power. To apply your wisdom not to be deviated by culture, not to be deviated by social media, not to be deviated by secular traditional humanism, not to be deviated by psychology, by the philosophies of men, but to walk by the wisdom of the spirit of the living God, by the wisdom of the spirit of the living God. The second prayer, we are praying just three prayers. God respects our choice so much. 
as loving as God is, He will never force anybody to go to heaven against their will. The will of a man is like the door. Jesus says in Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door. Can you imagine the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? The respect God has for your will is such that He can never force you. My spirit shall not strive with any man. We are going to yield our will to God. It's a conscious thing. This is something nobody can do for you. Your will is the greatest power God has given you. The power to choose. I set before you life and death. God's word and God's wisdom have been clearly communicated to us. But what are you willing to do? What do you want? What are you looking for? What is your choice? What are you What are you making your mind about? You are going to make that prayer and say, Lord, I yield my will to you. By your mercy, Lord, prevail, prevail over me. Prevail over me. It took God a whole night to prevail over Jacob. Prevail over me. God should have strong God. to receive mercy. Mercy is very vital for destiny. Some people got married, like my dad, when he got married, he didn't know Christ, but he obtained mercy. God had mercy on him. He says, it's not of him that will it, it's not of him that run it, it's of God that showed mercy. Can we just lift our hands and say, Lord, I receive your mercy. For my marital life and my marital destiny, I receive your mercy. The mercy of God can go anywhere. The mercy of God can go anywhere. The mercy of God can go anywhere. Lord, I receive mercy. Sir, take over. Take over. The
that God is able to do is cause a renewal. God is able to bring back from the dead dry bones. God is able to create new opportunities. You failed before but God is going to give you a fresh start. You missed it before but God is able to give you a new beginning. I want you to lift your hands and thank him for what you have heard. For some of us, whether in our relationships or in our marriages, we have seen some areas where we need to make adjustment. But thank him because you are still alive to make amends. Thank him because tonight, by reason of all that you have heard, all things are now new. All things are renewed. He says, Arise, shine, for your light has come and the, your, the glory of the Lord is risen over you. Your light has come tonight. One more time, you may. Before we close, all standing, I want to make the altar call. First of all, if you know you are here, you don't know the Lord Jesus sincerely from your heart. You don't have to be ashamed. If a man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All that you have heard will only make sense if you are born again. If you are here and you don't know the Lord Jesus, please just lift your hands wherever you are. I want to pray with you. But more importantly, there are some people here with what you have heard tonight, you want to rededicate your life. You need a restoration in your spiritual life. You want God to renew everything again. Probably you lost it at some point or you grew cold spiritually. I told us the spiritual is one of the pillars. And you want God to restore you tonight. If you are in that category, please lift your hands wherever you are. Quickly before we close. And let's just pray with you before we are done. God bless you, sir. Please celebrate God. I see one hand lifted. Please lift your hands. Man or woman, boy or girl. You want to surrender to the Lord or you want to rededicate afresh. You want to rededicate afresh. Please lift your hands. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. If your hands are lifted up, please come. Come. Come to the front. I want to pray for you. Can we celebrate God? The Bible says there is joy in heaven if one sin and repents. Can we celebrate God for them? Your life is about to take a new walk with God. Now those of us in the congregation, please... Just respectfully stretch your hands towards these ones. And if you are in the congregation and you need to join them, please join them while I'm making the prayer. Once we are done with the last amen, it is assumed you are not saved if you are out. Someone once said, if you are not saved, you are not saved. Those of you that are online and we want to make a commitment to Jesus, I want you to repeat the prayers as I lead these ones. If you are in front with me, open your mouth and say after me, Father... I come to you today, I'm sorry for my sins, I thank you because you sent your son to die for my sins. I receive therefore eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for saving me in Jesus name.
Father, I declare over these ones by the authority of your word that their sins are forgiven. I declare that they are now new creatures in Christ Jesus. I declare that the life of God comes into them now by your precious Holy Spirit. And I declare in the name of Jesus, along with the congregation of your people, that from today they receive the victory over sin, over death and over the devil, over death and over the devil. They will serve you all the days of their lives. blessed and inspired by this message and wish to have more messages and updates on our weekly programs, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Telegram, Facebook page, and Twitter at SGNI Numatech. Also feel free to call us for prayers, counseling, and inquiries 